Okay, so so two things to mention before we start, and I uh, after this I will also look into the chat for questions before we start. But the first one is uh, for those who are doing MSAF for uh, for labs, uh, all the C labs, which means lab zero up to three, would be due if you did an MSAF for that uh, before lab four, which is the first lab in Java. So the main idea is I would have two deadlines for MSAF labs, one for the C labs and one for the Java labs. The one for the C labs would be the first deadline of the Java lab, good, which is going to be uh, lab four. I will send in a detailed announcement on, on Avenue for this, good. Uh, the second thing is, Oh, now it would be three things because I just remembered one thing. The second thing is uh, lab two is not due in, in uh, next week, it's the week after because next week we have the reading week. I guess you already all know this, but that's some good news. The third thing is uh, I have observed from lab one and mainly in lab two that you guys don't go to lab sessions. Uh, that's completely okay. I mean, as I said before, lab sessions are more of office hours rather than doing a demo. Uh, but what is not okay is that you all scramble up two hours before the deadline on Friday night facing problems and you kind of expect to get some help for that, right? Uh, that's, that's very tough to do. Even if I try my best to do this, it wouldn't work, right? Because some problems would require sharing a screen, taking some time to try stuff, and you cannot do a lab in a couple of hours. So as a general rule, and I'm going to put this on Avenue as well, as a general rule, I'm, I'm going to say for the Friday deadline uh, of any lab after 5 p.m., which is after the finish time of, of the lab of that day, neither me or the TAs are going to take any questions. And I believe this is completely fair because we provide help every day for four hours of office hours, three hours of lab every day, for you to try things and come seek help. And many of you already does, which is perfect. But for those who are leaving the lab for the last minute, you should also expect you wouldn't get the help that you, you need, right? This is something that I wanted to make very clear to make sure in subsequent labs, uh, I avoid such problems. Uh, if you have any questions, let me know. I'm going to post also what I mentioned now uh, on Avenue and, and hopefully that's clear. Uh, from the chat, no questions, so I can start immediately. Okay, so last time we stopped at discussing uh, pointers and strings, and we said generally don't use a pointer to define an, or declare an array. Uh, you can do this only for strings, but it's going to be read only, so it's again problematic, you cannot change. So the general rule that we take out of, of that is don't use pointers to declare arrays. What you can do is define or declare the array independently and then use a pointer to, um, then use a pointer to, um, to, to refer to elements of that array. And we have seen multiple examples about this before. Good. So now, given that we have two lectures in, uh, in, in pointers, we will build even like in, in a more complex way. So we will start by defining uh, dynamic memory allocation and how to use pointers to allocate memory on the fly uh, rather than doing the fixed array stuff, right? Remember when we started arrays, we said you have to specify your array size completely at the beginning statically, right? But what if you have data that you don't know how much it is? For example, you are reading something from a user uh, it's inserting certain number of students, but you don't know how many students, and, or you want to make it generic. Then you cannot use a fixed size array unless you define a very large array that some of, some of it can be underutilized. So the better way or the more professional way is to use dynamic memory allocation. But to discuss dynamic memory allocation, we need first to discuss something uh, that is called the size of operator, because you want to allocate your memory based on a certain size. Uh, so what is this size thing? We have an operator called size of, which takes uh, a variable name or even a data type and returns to you how many bytes are allocated in memory for this variable or for this type, right? So let's have some examples to make sure we understand. So you can pass into it an immediate value. And in this case, it will be a floating point one. You can pass into it a variable, like for example, an array element or even a pointer or a data type like character, for example. 
And what is going to return to you is how many bytes are allocated in memory for this variable or for this certain type. Uh, for example, here I'm doing size of B, which is going to return to you the bytes that are stored, the number of bytes that are allocated in memory to store the pointer variable, which you can find as either four bytes or eight bytes based on your uh, hardware. Uh, the same thing for F, you can even call it for a whole array and it returns you the, like the, the total number of bytes allocated in the memory for storing all the array elements. You can also do this for a string array. You can do it almost for anything, right? Why this is useful? Why we are discussing this in the context of, uh, of uh, dynamic memory allocation and pointers? Because as I said, when, you, when we will see later, when you allocate a memory dynamically, you need to allocate a chunk of memory but usually you don't have the absolute, uh, the absolute number of bytes you need. Uh, usually you know that, for example, you need four int elements, 10 int elements or so, right? So uh, how can you know the total number of bytes? Do you need to calculate them in paper and then write the total number? That's not very practical and sometimes is also prone to human error. So instead of this, we will use the size of to tell us that Okay, I want 10 int elements, then size of 10 int, and it will give you the size yourself, which is basically multiplying 10 by four in the case of an int, for example, right? We will see this later, but that's the first thing to introduce. The second thing to introduce, and we discussed before, is the lifetime of an object. So we have what we call automatic story, like storage duration and static storage, storage duration. We, should, we, we said by default, any variable you create uh, or you, you um, you declare whether it's global or, or local, let's talk about local for now, it has a certain duration in memory that afterwards is going to be destroyed. For example, if you define a variable that is local to a function, once you enter the function, the variable get declared, allocated in memory, and once you exit the function by return, this function storage in memory, sorry, this variable storage in memory is going to be destroyed, right? So the storage duration of this variable is only the time that you are executing the function that is being declared in, good? This, is, this has already been uh, discussed before. And then we said, what can we do to make sure I can um, maintain a variable for a longer duration? For example, the full execution of the program. We said you can use the static word, the static reserved word, and to do this, uh, you just do static and then the data type, for example, static int x, and if you define a variable as static, it will exist in the memory during the whole program execution, and it carries the <clears throat> sorry, and it carries the data forward across different function calls. Good. <clears throat> Today we are going to introduce a completely different way. So until now we only have two options: automatic duration, you don't control that, or static duration. Again, you don't control, but you keep for a longer time. Is there a more general way, which is I define it in memory when I need it, I destroy it when I need as well. So you have the control. And this is again, taking us into dynamic memory allocation. Good. So how to do this? So by using certain functions in C, you can dynamically allocate memory. We have mainly three functions, a function called malloc, which is memory allocation, calloc, which is contiguous allocation and reallocation. Realloc. So I would suggest or recommend against using reallocation at all. So don't use this. I will explain briefly, but that's optional. And I would say don't even use it. Uh, we will focus mainly in malloc, but calloc is exactly the same thing. So we will also introduce it in, in brief, but you can use it the same way that you use malloc, as we'll see right now. The main idea behind all of this is you can allocate a contiguous portion in memory dynamically, use it, and then destroy it when you don't need it, good? And instead of just defining an array at the beginning, you define it either static or not static, and then you use it, you have a fixed size, you cannot go beyond, good? To be able to use malloc or calloc or, or, or dynamic memory allocation in general, you need to include the standard C library header file, standard lab.h. So one last thing. So we, so far we introduced two things that are kind of needed for dynamic memory allocation. The first one is the size of. The second one is the storage duration in memory for any variable. The third one would be the void pointer, right? So far we know pointers, 
we know that pointers are pointing to a certain type, but we never had, and, and I was expecting this question, but we didn't get in fact. So I, uh, I was surprised that I didn't get this question because we said a pointer can point to any type, but what about void? What if it's not pointing to a certain type? Because we have been using voids in functional returns, for example. So you can define a pointer of type void like this. The good thing about this pointer uh, of type void is it's kind of generic. You can use it later to point to anything because you didn't specify it from the beginning. Remember, the problem is if you define your pointer as end, you cannot use it to point. And we said this in the first lecture of pointers, let's call this pointer and this is X. You cannot make pointer point to X, right? That's wrong. Why? Because it's a different type. Once you specify the pointer type, you cannot make it point into a different type. Good? Unless the exception here, if you define this as void, it can point to anything. So if you don't know the type of data initially, then it's better to use void pointer. Good? The problem here is you cannot dereference the pointer of type void because Theoretically, it doesn't have any data type that it's pointing to. So you cannot do dereferencing for this. What you can do instead is define another pointer of the correct type. We will see in more details some examples and then assign the void to the certain type pointer that you use. When a void pointer points to an end, does it data type change? It remains, no, that's a good question, uh, Salah. So it remains a void pointer, but it's pointing to an end, for example, or in our example here, it's pointing to a double but you cannot dereference it, right? So what you can do later is define an end pointer and assign it the void pointer that you defined, right? We will see this in later in, 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 in detailed examples, but this was the third thing that we needed for dynamic memory allocation. The question might be is, why do I need this for dynamic memory allocation? Because once you allocate memory in your, or certain memory in your memory hardware or certain storage in your hardware, you need to know what address did you define? I mean. Assume that this is your total memory. You allocated a certain portion here using malloc, for example, but how to access it if you don't have an address to this type, right? So malloc is going to return to you an address of the first byte of the memory you allocated, and this address is generally in the form of a void pointer, right? This is why we needed to introduce void pointer. Why is void pointer? because you don't know what is the type of the data that you are going to store in this memory. This memory is just allocated, but it doesn't have a certain type. So it's better to make it void first and then define the type as you go. Good? Okay, so these are the three things we needed to introduce. Now, given that we know all these three, let's see how we use malloc, for example, or calloc for, for that. So malloc is just a very normal function that it takes some inputs and it returns you an output, right? The output that it returns, we already mentioned, which is an address to the first element. So it returns a pointer that is pointing to the first byte of the allocated memory. So we are done with the return type. What about the input that it takes? It just takes a number of bytes you need to allocate in the memory. So generally a number of bytes. The thing to know is once you call malloc, it has two possibilities. Either it succeeds or fails. Succeeds means it allocates the memory you are asking for. Fails means, for example, you don't have enough space in memory to allocate this chunk. Assume, for example, you want to allocate one gigabyte of memory, but you have a total RAM of, I don't know, like two gigabytes and you are already using 1.5 of them. So you don't have enough space. In this case, the malloc will fail, right? What would happen if malloc fails? The void pointer would be a null. So it will return a null pointer if the request cannot be satisfied. So if it fails, it returns a null pointer. If it doesn't fail, it will return a pointer to the first address as we said. The last thing to know about malloc is that the data that you, or, or the locations that you initialize or declare in, not initialize, that's the bad word, but the location that you allocate in memory are not initialized at all, right? So they just contain garbage. Right? This is aligning with what we said before, is defining a variable in C. It just gets whatever garbage is there. It's not initialized by default. So once you allocate a memory using malloc, you need to initialize it yourself, as we will see now. Good? Is there any question here? Arjun, 
do our null pointers treat it as Boolean false? <coughs> That's an excellent question, Arjun. You would, you would need to use it as an indication. For example, it's a Boolean that if you, if you return null, that means it didn't succeed and you do something else. So inside your main, what you can do is you do an if condition. If it returns something other than null, it succeeds, otherwise it fails. And we will see this. Is size underscore t equal size of, Nicole? No, that's not correct. And that's a good question. Size t is a type, a special type in C that generally takes an integer value uh, because it takes number of bytes. We will see how to use this using size of. So size of is a special thing. It's like a function. It's an operator, but it's, it's like a function that it takes input parameter here and returns you the number of bytes that are allocated. Size t n here, this is the input that you're going to feed into the size tn. So this is like an integer value of number of bytes, good? It will be clear by examples. What about calloc? As I said, it's very similar to malloc. The only difference is that instead of defining this as a 1D contiguous bytes of memory, maybe you would like to define this as array format, right? So what, what it means is you know you need certain number of elements and each element has a certain number of bytes. For example, here, n, which you take as an input, is the total number of bytes. But here, you would say, I want m elements, and each of them has n bytes. So you give more details, right? It's like a form of an array, where the array has m elements, each element is n bytes. That means, if you compare this with this data that is stored, n here is equal to m multiplied by n here, correct? Because you here define m elements, each of them is n bytes, that means the total number of bytes is m multiplied by n, which what you feed to the malloc as an input. So in other words, malloc takes the total number of bytes, while calloc takes a little bit more detail, which is how many elements you need and what is the size of a certain element, good? The other only difference than just taking two input parameters rather than one, is that the storage defined or declared using calloc is initialized to zero. So here in malloc, it's not initialized at all, but in calloc, you initialize all the data to zero as if you are defining an array, right? Good. So perfect. Assume now I defined, before going into examples, assume the step is I know over uh, runtime, I need certain number of bytes in the memory. I use malloc or even calloc because both return the same thing, by the way. I use malloc to, de to declare this size of memory, which I have done myself, not the compiler or the language or the hardware uh, has done to me or for me. So what I, what I need to do is after using this memory, you have to free it, right? So you are doing the freeing yourself. So if you declare or reserve certain number of bytes in the memory, you have to free them once they are, you are done with them. Otherwise, your memory will fill up very quickly and your program will fail, right? In other languages like Java, you don't need to care about all of this, right? You don't allocate memory and you don't free it because all the memory operations are done in the background through what is called garbage collection in Python or in Java. But in C, again, you have a low level control. You can dynamically allocate your memory yourself you have a control of how many bytes you really need, but after you use them, you have to pay the cost of responsibility and then free this memory yourself, good? So these are the main two steps you have to do when you declare a memory dynamically in your program, good? Okay. Reallocate, uh, it's a bit of a theme. Maybe I, instead of not confuse you, I will leave this for now give you some examples because I have been talking for, for, for so long and then we'll come back to reallocate uh, if, if, if we've got the time. So let's say now I want to define an array that is a variable length array, good? Previously, by just declaring an array, I have to specify the size, if you remember. Now I am going to use dynamic memory allocation for this, which means I don't need to specify the size during static time. I can even ask the user to input the size, right? So what I'm doing in this example, I'm asking the user to input the size of the array through a scan f, which is done dynamically during runtime. This is what is meant by dynamic, by the way. Dynamic means during runtime, you don't know beforehand how many bytes you would need. 
And then based on this, for example, if, um, if, if the user is inputting something less than zero, that means less than number of bytes, this is just a guard against if you enter a negative number, but that's, that's just a check. Once you get the N from the user, now you use malloc. That's the most important thing that I would like to look for, right? So what I want to do is I want to create an array of a specified size during runtime, but this array should be of type float, good? So all the elements would be floating point, float. And I'm asking the user to input the number of elements. Once the user gives me N, how to calculate how many bytes I would need in memory? Simply what can I do? Take the N and multiply this by the size of a single float variable, which I can get using the size of operator that we discussed before, right? So using size of float, it returns you something like, I don't know, eight bytes or four bytes. And then you multiply this by the number of elements. It gives you the total number of bytes you need in your memory. And then when malloc runs, it allocates this and it returns to you a pointer B here that points to the first byte. Good. One thing we said is that malloc is returning a void pointer, right? So here, this is returning to me a void pointer. But now I'm taking this into B, which is a float pointer, right? This is like casting, if you remember, right? Why this works? Because you can cast a void pointer to any type of pointers. Given now that we know when writing the program that we are expecting a floating point uh, or float type variables, that means I need a float pointer, and this is how I define B as float. And then taking malloc into this float is accepted because malloc is returning void, and void can be casted to any type of pointer. Good? Is that clear? If I do this in a two-step to further clarify the point, I would define here another pointer of type void. I call it void pointer. And then I would take this as pointer here. And then later I can say B equal point, sorry. Ah, uh, yeah, B equal pointer. That's also accepted. This is just what we had before we was doing all these steps in one, in one step. Let me take questions now. Can you repeat when does a malloc fail? Yes, Allah. So malloc can fail simply if you don't have enough space in memory that is contiguous to allocate for you, right? So malloc and clock create arrays. No, it creates or allocates a space in memory. You can use this using arrays or any other thing generally, but one simple and common use case is dynamic array. That's correct. Ian, why do you initialize B to null? Uh, just... Uh, Okay, that's a good question. So I, I'm initializing this to null because later I would like to check, as we will see in the code, whether really B is remaining as null or not. Because if it remains as null, that means malloc failed. So later what I should do, I should do a check even before this. What, what should I do? Here I should do a check, and this is what Arjun was asking about. If B is still null, I would just say print if something like oh, memory allocation failed, right? Or, or any message, let's just call it failed for now. Right, and then uh, the new line here, and then we are done. Else, then you continue your program as usual, right? Maybe here even you return zero, right? So I'm initializing it to null because I know that malloc is returning a null, and then in, it's like initialization to zero, right? And then afterwards, if malloc succeeds, this null will be overwritten, good? So let me see remaining questions. After assigning, is there a still an anonymous void pointer? So B, if you are referring to this one, uh, then B is originally not even a void pointer. I defined it as a float. But if you are referring to what I have been doing as pointer equal this, and then B equal pointer, then yes, pointer remains a void pointer no matter what, because malloc is originally even returning void pointer, right? So the, the, the type void does not change. Why are you doing 
size of float when n is an int, won't that be wrong amount of memory allocated? So Arjun, so differentiate between two things. n is the number of elements of the array you need, which always will be n, right? Because you have four elements, five elements, and it, it, even more strictly, it will be a positive number, right? Or, or, or zero or larger number, so non-negative value. But the float is, so if you have a float array, something like this, let's say I have four elements, right? When I say I have four elements, so n is an int, which is four, while each element of this is a float, because this is a float array. So this, this is the difference between both, both things. Nicole, b is the address of the first byte of n. That's correct, that's correct. B is the address of this first byte here. Yan Hao, so basically what malloc do is increase the size of some type, like initially int can store four, but you can modify it. So that's not the right way of saying it, Yan Hao, because it doesn't change the number of bytes of an int, it just allocates more data or more storage in memory, right? So you have whatever number of bytes you need. Okay, good. So let's continue and I will revisit questions uh, if you guys have further ones. So let's see the remaining code. So after I allocated this memory, let's see how we use it. So now I can kind of try to initialize it or ask the user to input the data. So I would say I, I'm going through all the elements one by one. I'm asking the user to input the value of the elements and then uh, I will scan it and then take it in B plus I. From yesterday, you should know why this works, right? Because B plus I is equi equivalent to saying what? Equivalent to say BI, right? Remember this from yesterday? So now I'm taking every element which is float and put it in a certain uh, array entry. And then by increasing I, I'm moving from B0, B1, B2, B3, B4. And then after taking all the initial values, maybe I'll try to brand them to, um, to make sure that the data is embedded correctly. And then this is just like a logging or debugging uh, scheme. And here, I want to bring the value and the index. So the index is an int. This is why I'm saying B of I equal this. And then the value is the dereferencing of the pointer B plus I, right? In other words, I can do this as B I, or I can do this as, oh, now I don't have the array name. So these are the only ways of doing it, right? And here I'm printing it as a float. Good. Is there any question? Sarah, if you were to use Kalok, how would you differ? I, I guess I have an example for Kalok and I will come into it. Uh, Salah, what does this program do in summary? So Salah, what it does, it asks the user to input a certain number, which you take as your element, number of elements in array. You dynamically allocate this number of elements of the array in the memory. And then you ask the user to input their values one by one, and then you print it back. Okay. Why would you want to dynamically create an array? What is the benefit? That's, that's a very fundamental question, Hassan. So why I would like to do this? Because for example, here I'm asking the user to input the number of elements. Like, let's take a use case. For example, assume you have a class that can have, like from year to year, can have, can, can has different, uh, can have different number of students. One year is 200, another year 250, 210, whatever, right? So this is a changing number. So you want your program to work in a way such that at the beginning, when I'm using the program as a user, I enter the number of students registered, for example. And this is a dynamically changing number, right? Because from one year, it can be one thing, from another year, it can be another thing. So I cannot statically define it, right? Then for this use case, you can never use arrays, right? Why? Because arrays must have a static uh, size, right? Like for example, you can say my array maximum size is 300 right? You can tell me that, okay, maybe I would just look for the maximum capacity and then choose this. I'm telling you, what if you have 1,000 students in one year, but 10 in another year, right? So that now you, if you define your aesthetic array as 1,000, when you have the use case of 10, you are wasting 90% of your memory allocated to the array with no use, right? That's a waste of memory. So statically, defining the array is either going beyond the boundary, so it's, you are going to exceed it, 
or you will underutilize it because you defined it in a conservative way. Good? All these problems does not exist, don't exist if you define your array dynamically because you know the number on runtime. So you say, I want 10 elements. You just allocate 10 elements. You want 20, then you allocate 20, right? And how? So basically what Malok do is increase the size. Oh, I guess I addressed this. Sir, Ian, what is Mark? So if you use malloc for eight bytes, for example, could you store a mixture of types like one int and one for char? Perfect. That's an excellent question, Mark, although it's a kind of an advanced one. Yes, you can, because malloc uh, does not enforce you of a certain type. It just gives you this storage in memory. It's like giving you, uh, uh, I would say, a one-bedroom apartment. Whoever stays there, there is no constraint. So it gives you the space, and it doesn't constrain the types that you can, uh, you can, you can store these, uh, the types of the variables you store in this storage. But that said, is this is a good mechanism or a good or professional way of doing things? You can imagine that this can be very complex if you do such a thing. So maybe it's a better way of to say, if I know mixture of types, I would doing their malloc in a separate malloc function other than one, because things can get very complex and nasty. Ian, what is this? Okay, so this is a, a formatting of the printf using the floating point thing. But, um, so I guess we discussed this, why it doesn't, um, let me see. Yeah, good. So your question Ian, is about this. This is a string formatting. You basically say I need six places and only two uh, floating point uh, accuracy thing. I would say please revisit the lecture when we discuss how to format your printf for more details. Um, catchy. Why? What is this? So, catch. Why don't you need BL in the second for loop? Second for loop is this one. So you can, so, so instead of this, you can do BI if you would like. Remember from yesterday lecture, we said these two are equivalent. This gives you the element BI in your array, and this is going to the address of B, add it to I, which is going to point to this element address and then do dereferencing. So both are equivalent. Yesterday we discussed four different ways of doing this thing. Um, yeah, Nicole, that's not allowed in, in C. You cannot just take in as an input and then initialize it because, so, so what would be the value that you would do? So for example, if you say something like int array size n, and then this n is read by this, you, you would fail because here this would require you to have a, a static value that is not allowed in C. And I guess we have a, I have a slide that revisits this concept that we discussed before. So you cannot dynamically allocate the size of the array. So you uh, can't just ask the user for the array size and then, yeah. Why can't you do that? It's not yeah, allowed so, in C. So, 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 so good. So, so for two reasons. The first one is in C89, which is the one we assume, which is like the, the the, the, the old C version, this is not even allowed to specify the size of your array as an int. It has to be a, a constant value, right? Or an immediate value. But even for more recent C values where it allows things to be n and what you said can be done, uh, the, the main problem is during runtime, so you either, so, so for example, so assume I, I do what you mentioned for an enter array, and I'm asking the user to input 10, and if you try for some C language, it will be accepted. But then what if you cannot allocate this in memory? So then it will not give you anything. You cannot even check this in your memory by, by checking whether the pointer is null or not, right? So you cannot even do a guard against what happens during runtime, right? So it's because it's not meant originally for dynamic allocation, right? Although more recent C, versions allow it for, for specifying a variable as an array size, it doesn't give you the full capability of dynamic memory allocation, right? You don't have the control. 
because it doesn't give you a pointer to the first address that returns a null if it doesn't succeed. And if it succeeds, it gives you the address, right? It's not malloc. So the more professional way of doing dynamic memory allocation in C is malloc. And this is why we said in, in, in 2SH4, even defining array sizes as int will not be accepted. They have to be either an immediate value or a constant value, right? And, and which is the good programming practice in, in, uh, in any industry environment. I hope this, this answers your question. The, the, the second reason, but this is more of an advanced one related to Mark's question and I don't want to get across is by doing this, all your array elements are of the same uh, size, right? And if you go beyond your array boundaries, for example, you ask the user to input 10, but then the user inputs something or, or you need at a certain point to increase from 10 to 20. You cannot resize this array, but using dynamic memory allocation, you can resize it using reallocate. Also, array gives you a fixed type. It has to be end or float or something, while malloc gives you only memory storage as it was answering Mark, while you can store whatever you'd like to store here, right? And then later fragment it, have another pointer. There are so many details with advanced dynamic memory allocation that we will, fee, we will see in subsequent lectures that uh, are not possible using static arrays, right? But okay. yeah. I, I, I guess for now, maybe you take the first answer, which is arrays has to be a fixed size, while malloc can allow you to have dynamic size array. And then for the advanced ones, we will come into it later. Okay. Good. Thank you. Sandy, can't you just ask for the user? I guess this is exactly the same as this question was. For the first of for loop, don't you need to do to store the value in the array address? Uh, no. Right, because scan f, that's a good point as well. So Moaz's question is why here I don't do dereferencing? Because remember, scan f needs to take the entry by reference, which you have to pass the address of the entry, not the entry value. So b plus i is the address, right? Another way of doing this is to say and b i, right? Uh, Yan Hao, after you call malloc for the void pointer it return, does it destroy itself after you assign it to another pointer B plus I itself is an address, I think. Okay, that's an excellent question, Yan Hao. No, it doesn't destroy, nothing destroys itself, right? So we'll see that you have to free pointers and, and free memory yourself. Good, that's a good question, thank you. But, but the thing to mention is if you exit the program, for example, or exit the main, or if you define this void pointer inside a function, a void pointer is a variable, which has its own um, a storage duration that we were discussing right now. So it will get destroyed by default when you exit, but it doesn't get destroyed immediately if you assign it to another one. Good. You guys are asking excellent questions. That's good. So after I'm done with all of this, the last step that we mentioned is that you need to free up all these memories. You need to say, now I don't use it. Otherwise you will fill up stuff, right? So to allow the reuse. And to do this, you just simply do free, and then you have to pass the exact same pointer that you used to read the malloc. So here it was B, then here you have to use B. Good. And this is how you use free. So what, what does free do again? Simply just destroy this memory and, and like just deallocate it, right? You don't have access to it anymore. Okay. Is that good? Perfect. So... Let's, let's have another example. Let's, we still have 10 minutes. That's perfect. We can go through the example. So in this example, I want to, add, to write a function uh, that adds n-dimensional, like two n-dimensional vectors. So I would have two vectors. Each of them has n elements. And then I want to add these. And each vector is like an n-size array. The array names correspond the vectors to be added are passed to the function as arguments. So I take the, the vectors as argument. Remember, this is the first question in lab two, right? You're just taking two vectors as an input, you add them, and then you return uh, a third vector. Where to store the sum vector? Another thing, so we have multiple options. Create an array to store the sum of the vectors in the caller and pass it in the name to the function. This is lab two, question one. We do exactly this. We define a third array, which we pass as an input parameter, such that we add the values into the two inputs and then put, put this result value in, in the sum array. 
An alternative is to, to create an array to store the sum in the function itself. But we said if you define an array inside the function, you will not be able to return because functions don't return arrays, right? Yes, this was before knowing pointers. Now, knowing that an array can have a pointer to the first element, I can just simply return a pointer to the first element of the array to the caller and hence the caller can use it, right? So this is an advanced way. If you are asked in an interview, for example, this is an advanced way of returning an array from a function. The first one we have been using a lot, which is passing this array as an input parameter. The second one is tricky and is using pointers because you say, okay, I'm defining an array inside the called function. I cannot return it, but I can simply return a pointer, which can point to the first element of that array. Good. So let's, let's see here. So I have my main, I initialized my vectors, and then now I am adding, this is the add function that I would like to write. I'm adding these two vectors, I'm passing the size as well. Good. And now I'm returning a pointer to the result. And then here we just do something like printing it, for example, and then at the end I'm saying what are the results that I had. Good. So let's see how I would do the add, right? Simply I would take the two vectors as an input. So vector one will be passed here. Vector two will be passed here. This is the size, which is four in this example. Inside the function, I'm defining a sum array. And then at the end, I want to return the pointer. Here, it returns a pointer of type end. I'm returning a pointer to the first element. Good. We have a problem here. What is the problem? What do you think? Would this, would this way work? Need to implement add. I mean, yeah, adding, that's, that, that's the same. But I would say, let's say we just added a single line of adding. Would this work? Wouldn't sum get destroyed exactly and how? That's the problem. If I do this, in sum here is a local variable array, right? Which means it gets defined once, once you enter the function and it gets destroyed once you return. So even if you return the pointer to the first address, the memory itself is destroyed once you exit, right? So you need to do something different, right? Or, or modify it a little bit. Do you have suggestions what we can do? Malloc, exactly, Mark. Now Malloc is playing the rule. Is Malloc doesn't only do a dynamic allocation for you, it also allows you to control the duration of this memory that exists, like the duration of the storage to exist in the memory, right? And this is another reason for the question that's why dynamic memory allocation is better than defining arrays, uh, because you don't only control what is the size, which you can do for arrays in modern C versions, you can also control the duration. And this is one reason why we discussed the duration of variables at the second thing at the beginning of this lecture, if you remember, right? So if you use malloc, what I can do is I would come here. I, I can do the malloc in, in two different places now, right? One of them is at the function itself. The second one is at the main, right? So. If I do the malloc at the function, sorry, if I do the malloc at the main, I would have to pass the pointer here to the function, right? If I do the malloc inside the add function, that means now I'm dynamically allocating the sum array and I'm returning the pointer of this sum array, but I don't free it, which means it doesn't get destroyed here. So the memory you allocate using malloc, it doesn't get destroyed by default, right? You have to destroy it yourself. Here you have the control. So you only do the free after you use your data. So you do the free at the end of the main. By doing this, you are able to allocate something inside a function. So let's say this is the memory space of the function. This is the memory space of your main, right? Function variables by default are getting defined inside the stack of the function. So it's, it's in the stack. For example, in the previous example we had here, this sum 
So this is the stack of the function at. The sum array is defined here, which means it gets defined in, once you push the function in the stack and it gets destroyed after you exit. If we come into dynamic memory allocation, it's different because dynamic memory allocation is done at the heap. A heap is a type of a memory that it doesn't get destroyed by default once you exit the function stack, right? So even if I define Q here, inside, I mean, here as, as a matter of time, but it doesn't get in, defined inside the stack, it gets defined inside the heap, which means it will exist even if I destroy the function by the return, right? And by passing this pointer to the main, the main has access to the full array, right? Is that clear? Please ask if you have questions. This type of heap stack memory duration, you wouldn't be able to get from kind of programming easily at least from programming forums or, or, or it's not something that's very clear for many programmers if they take programming as a hobby. So it's more of an engineering concept that you need to understand. So if you have questions about it, ask about it because this is what differentiates a good programmer from uh, or, or an engineer from a different person. Good lab to question seven. Can we use function from question six? Oh, that's a lab question. Let's leave this for now, Aaron. Karina, so B and Q are two separate pointers. B and Q, oh yeah, exactly. B and Q are two separate pointers. One of them, they, they will be referring to the same thing, by the way. So for example here, okay, so let's visualize this. Inside the add, I defined this allocation thing. Let's say this is the memory, right? That I defined, this is your total memory. Here, Q is pointing here. And I'm returning Q in this line. And here, this is B. B is inside the main stack because it's a variable inside the B and also Q here. I'm returning from the function stack. So B will get the value of, of Q, which is this one. So B and Q are two different variables, that's correct, but they are pointing to the same thing, good? Because B will get the value of Q by the return, good? Okay, perfect. So I guess that's it for today. Please let me take questions if you have uh, one and make sure you understand this. Uh, and if you've got any question in mind, please ask because we will build on, on this for coming lectures as well. So B and Q are two separate points. That's correct. So you are setting B to Q. Yeah, you are setting, you are assigning B, Q value to B. That's correct. Can I say free Q instead of free B? No, that's a good question, Boxy. You cannot say here free Q. Why? Because Q is not a variable that is defined inside the main. So you will get that the variable is not defined. Again, because Q is a local variable to the function. Moaz, so we use malloc because otherwise the memory would get destroyed after the block of code. That's correct, Moaz. We utilize the feature of malloc that allows us to control the memory duration of, of the memory that I allocate. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Anthony, how limited is the storage in heap? That's an excellent question. It depends on your hardware. It depends on how many gigas of memories you would have. Uh, but heap and stack are dynamic. They don't have a fixed size. So the full memory space, but that's I, I, it's more of a, a microprocessor course topic rather than programming course topic. But if this is your total memory, assume that this is your stack. In fact, in most applications, stack grows down. <laughs> assume this is your stack and this is your heap. So both are on the same, I would say, place. So if this one grows, this one shrinks. If this one grows, this one shrinks, right? So it's a dynamic thing. Um, Karina, so Q is not defined in the main, but it can still hold the value that is after it is. No, Karina, it doesn't hold the value after. So if, once you return the value, it's similar to returning any value from a function. You just return it to the caller by value, but the variable itself get destroyed, right? Anthony. Is it dangerous to never delete it? Ah, oh, yeah, it's very dangerous to allocate a memory without freeing it because your memory will fill up very quickly and then you would uh, mismanage your, your resources. 
boxy. So Q is in the stack and the memory is in the and the memory is in the heap. I'm not sure if what you mean by ah oh, you mean the memory allocated. That's correct, boxy. That's correct. Q is in the stack of the function while the memory alloc dynamically allocated or the array that is dynamically allocated is in the heap. That's correct. Vector. So if we use an array, the memory gets wiped after the function call in the main. Exactly, vector. That's the reason why we use dynamic memory allocation. Why? So if we didn't use malloc, would the main function tell us there is no value? Uh, I'm not sure if what you mean, um, was, but I guess you are referring to the previous example of doing the array. So yes, there would be there would be either a garbage value there, anything, or it will tell you that this is not a, a this is a pointer. There is no pointing to a valid value. That's correct. So Karina, yeah. So so okay. Let's let me clarify this point because that's an important point. What you need to free is the memory that you dynamically allocated, right? Let me go back to the example. What you need to free is the memory that you dynamically allocated, which is this one that you used to get malloc, right? But the variable itself, Q, you already defined it. So this is as if it's a very normal variable. It happens to be a pointer. It happens to be a pointer that is pointing to a dynamically allocated memory. But at the end of the day, it's still a local variable to the function. So you don't have to free it. It gets destroyed at the end of the function by default, right? What doesn't get destroyed is the is the dynamically allocated memory space itself. I hope I hope that's clear now. Um, uh, hi, I just have a quick question about the, the lab too. Yeah, so can, can, can we postpone lab questions until I take all the questions related to lecture? Okay. And then, uh, yeah, thank you. Okay. Just, just to make sure we are in the flow. Um, wait, I thought you had to figure, okay, 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 don't because, okay, Nicole. That might be a weird one, but is there a part of memory in your computer that is reserved for people to write silly programs versus memory for actual useful? Uh, okay, that's that's in fact not a, a silly question, Nicole. It's 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 a very important question that is also discussed in microprocessor courses where you we're talking about virtual memory. So usually you don't have very direct access to the physical memory itself. Every program, whether you write yourself or even run like PowerPoint, Chrome, anything, has its own view of memory which is virtual and it doesn't have access to other programs memory, right? And virtual memory, one reason that most modern computing systems are using it is for the exact reason you are mentioning, whether uh, a malicious activity or an unintentional bad activity by like a hobby programmer, for example, can cause things to affect other programs. But even with this, you might still be not safe doing things using dynamic memory allocation. So there is no safe way. So any other programming language than C, you are much safer because the memory is handled in the background. You don't have direct access to it. Uh, but by being able to dynam dynamically allocate it, going beyond array limits, this doesn't happen in other languages. But in C, it's, it's a little bit not safe. So in C, you could like access the memory to, I don't know, Chrome or something. Like I don't get exactly uh, how. Yeah, it doesn't happen. So I, to be to be to be very clear, it doesn't it doesn't really happen because of the virtual memory. But again, it doesn't prevent you from going beyond array limited, um, like size, right? For example, you go beyond array boundaries. This might not affect other programs like Chrome, but it will affect the way your program is working. So okay, maybe I would I would a little bit visualize this. You will you you will all better understand that this concept when you talk about virtual memory in an architecture or an organization course. But very easily, let's say this is your uh, virtual memory and this is your physical memory. Your physical memory is your DRAM. As you have a four gigabytes of memory, this is the actual memory you would have. All operating systems deploy what is called as virtual memory, which is something that exists in your desk, in your hard desk, not in your memory, as if each program sees that it has its own version of memory, which is unlimited, right? And is divided into pages. And each process, this is called process in the terminology, but it's basically like an application, for example. Here you have a, a place for Chrome, a place for PowerPoint, whatever program you open, this is my C program. It has its own virtual memory, <clears throat> sorry. It has its own virtual memory space, correct? It doesn't okay. access the remaining space. 
The problem okay. is because virtual memory is much larger than the physical memory, multiple of these can get mapped to the same place, right? There okay. are some security mechanism, mechanisms against that, but it might also happen. And there are some hardware attacks that are leveraging this. So you might unintentionally modify something in your physical memory that can cause your program to crash or even the whole operating system virtual versus physical memory operation to, to crash, right? Okay. So I, I, it's a little bit of a detail, a complex topic, but I hope at least I, I made the intuition clear. Yeah, I was just curious. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. So pointer would exist in the memory good destroy and it would be the pointing to nothing. Uh, yes, B would be pointing to nothing. That's correct, Moaz. I guess you're talking about B in the main. Kutun, can we define a static array and add function so it doesn't get destroyed? That's an excellent question, Gotung, and I was expecting this earlier. So he is saying, if I went back to the previous example and I defined this sum as a static, it wouldn't get destroyed here. That's correct. And then in this case, I might be able to access it from outside if I pass the pointer to the first element. This is in fact a valid solution, but it has its own limitations, which is each time you call this function, some will hold the old value of, so assume for example, you want to add these two vectors. Afterwards, you define other two vectors and you recall add again. Some doesn't get zero, some holds the original value. And now you, you carry forward the value. So it shouldn't be a good solution. Although it's, it's like from the syntax point of view, it's correct. Arjun, so in that example, we can just read pointer Q as an array, like it has the same pointer. Yes, Arjun, from yesterday's lecture, you can deal with pointers that are pointing to arrays as if it's exactly an array that you can access using the index. What we called yesterday is called a pointer index uh, notation. Uh, I'm talking about on the next slide in your presentation uh, with the correct ad example. We yeah. use um, that cube. So you can treat that literally as if it's just an array. Yes. If you, so, so it depends on what you mean exactly by treating it as if it's an array. Because if you mean I can access the elements by like the array notation, that's correct. Yeah. It's a little bit different than array because of the reasons we discussed. For example, you still need to destroy your memory because it's dynamically allocated. But I guess you meant this, which is access these elements as if it's an array indexed. Memory, yeah, like correct? access and modify the indexes of the array and exactly. be able to search it. Can you do um, like uh, other array operations that are in yeah. C on it? Yeah, yeah, let's see the example we discussed here. We had exactly that, right? We asked the user to input certain elements and then we went through these elements one by one. We did a malloc and then we dealt with B as if it's an exactly array. We 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 updated its values by a scanf. As I said here, you can just do and bi and it would work. And now we printed them. So any operation you can do on an array, you can also do in the pointer that is pointing to an array. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Okay, let me see remaining questions. Um, Aaron, unless it's Rust. Well, this question, just to be clear, the malloc is like defining an array, but instead we are just defining a certain amount of memory instead of initializing an array of defined size. Yes, and it's a little bit more than this because you control its duration in memory and you control how much you, size you would need on the fly. But the general idea is the same, that's correct. Uh, the other thing is you don't have to use this memory as an array, you can use it as anything as different variables, for example, right? Although it's not the common case, but you have the full control of what you want to do with this memory. I guess Mark asked the question like half an hour ago about can I assign different variable types into this allocated memory? And theoretically, yes, you can. Katie, uh, you would still have to implement a way to add after the malloc, right? The malloc is just, ah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, we didn't add here, but because that is just symbol. So what you would write and instead of this add vector thing, you just say, let me see here. You would do something like this. You would do a for loop, and then the, in the for loop, you would do v1i plus v2i, and you take the value in qi, something like this inside the for loop. So yes, you still have to implement that. Okay, 
uh, if there is no other question, okay, and now there's a question. What happens if you do this? You define a pointer of int, and then you allocate. Yeah, that's a good question. And how? That's also valid. Remember, size of only returns you an integer number. It the only thing that double does for you here is just allocating a bigger size of number of bytes, right? Again, malloc does not dictate the type of the data that you can store in the allocated memory. Even if you use size of double or size of character, it only controls the number of bytes in total. For example, assume double variable takes eight bytes while n takes four. If you do malloc n multiply by size of n, then it will be four n bytes. If you do what you write right now, it would be eight n bytes. At the end, just a matter of bytes. There is no type double here at all, right? Well, so if I wanted to, I could allocate memory for a constant variable, for example. A memory for a constant variable. I'm not sure if I get this more as, but you can allocate a memory, which is a space, and you can put in this space whatever you would like in general. That's correct. each byte for one single element in array. Oh, I'm not sure I get this question how. Like we, you were talking about if we assign like a double to- Yeah. To an int, like does it, does it, what does it actually work is you are putting like, for example, um n is equal to four, but because you let four times the type size of double, so you okay. actually allocate eight byte for that, for that, for that inte in integer array j. Okay, okay. Let, is, let is, me, that, is that, is that, is that, yeah, I see. So let me, you were saying? let me see. So let's take it step by step. Doing a size of double, let's assume the size of double is eight for now, okay? Just to make it different than, than int. And then you, you give an example that n is four, right? So let's say four mm -hmm. multiplied by eight, this gives you 32 bytes, right? What okay. Malok is saying is I have a total of 32 bytes allocated mm -hmm. to you, and I'm returning a void pointer to you that is pointing to the first byte. So far, is there anything that is mentioning what type of data I have here? No. Are these kind of divided into array elements? Also, no. It just gives you a chunk as a whole, right? And later, then, I take, mm -hmm. sorry, give me a second. So later, I would take this pointer, which is void, and cast it into a type of int. Yeah. Which is saying now, implicitly, I want these data to be of type int, right? So what I mm -hmm. wanted to say is double here does not dictate at all the size of, uh, sorry, the type of the data, it only returns to you a number of bytes. Mm -hmm. Does this answer your question? Yeah, that really makes sense. And I don't really remember how, how many bytes does the integer takes, four bytes? Four. 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 So you actually give, like, so, so the size of this array is actually Ah, uh, it eight, can take right? much more. Yeah, I see, I see your point now, is now I can accommodate not just four bytes, I can accommodate here eight bytes. Yeah, ah, sorry, yeah. eight ints. Ah, that's correct. Ah, okay, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Sorry, you had 32 bytes, yeah, that's correct. So you can even say I can accommodate four ints which take 16 bytes and two doubles, which take eight each, right? Again, nothing is dictating what type of data you would have inside the dynamically allocated memory, right? I see, thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, perfect. So uh, I guess by, by this, I would see you all guys on, on Friday for, uh, for the tutorial. Arjun, how could clock look for the add function? R malloc and size those and clock equal? Clock would only, okay, so let, I guess someone asked about this and I said I will come into an example. I guess we have this in the, in the coming lecture, but quickly, let's do it. If I'm going to use clock, it would be like this, clock, and then now, I pass in as a single parameter, and the second parameter would be size of int. This is the only difference that clock would give you as a calling thing. So it they're basically take, yeah. interchangeable then, like there's 
It's just whatever. Ah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's like four and while. It's just different way of doing things. The only change is that clock is initializing the whole thing for you by zero, right? But malloc doesn't do any initialization. Oh, so it, it fills all the spaces with zeros. With zeros, that's correct. Oh, okay. So if you have something where you need to take the sum of it and you don't want it to accidentally have values that you don't want, then using calloc might be a better idea because then sure. you don't have to manually assign the zeros. That's correct. That's okay. completely correct. All right. Thank you. Why? Wow. So malloc is in a defined type, but since we set it equal to B, which was of type int, malloc would hold int values as well then. Yeah, malloc is just a function that returns to you a pointer. I guess you are referring to the data that is, or not the data, the, the locations in the memory that's getting allocated. Yes, the, it doesn't dictate any type for you, but you dictate the type by the type of the pointer you define. That's correct, Mars. Okay, perfect. So I, I would talk to you all guys on, uh, on Friday then. Hi. Yeah, I, I just have a quick question. About, oh, there uh, was a question in the lab. Sorry. Yes. Sorry, sorry. There you go. go ahead. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, so for question seven, can we use function from question six? Uh, I don't recall what was the question itself. Oh, so question six is about uh, um, creating an efficient sparse array by uh, having two array. Of ah, I remember. I remember. Okay, okay, okay. Here is, here is the thing, right? Okay, okay. Now I remember. So one yeah. thing I mentioned in the last tutorial is I can simply write the solution for question seven by, so question seven is taking as an input the efficient representation of the two input vectors, correct? Yeah. What I can do is just take these two efficient representations, transform them into the original sparse vector using a reconstruct function from sex. Okay. Add them very normally and right. then return it to the efficient format and then return this efficient format, correct? Oh, so basically we can use the function from question six, right? If you do this, you get zero. <laughs> oh, okay. Because that's very obvious, right? Like that's, right. And, and the question itself state this very clearly. You have to do the add operations on the sparse, uh, sorry, on the efficient representation, not in the original representation. I guess, okay. yeah, um, so right. you are Aaron, right? Aaron? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so Aaron, I guess maybe something you can do is you can quickly look into the video of the tutorial because I, I guess I spent like 10 minutes explaining, explaining uh, this kind of point, what you need to do for question seven. Uh, but, but, but the summary is no, don't, don't do this. You have to perform, you have to stake the question seven requirement, which is performing the addition operation on the efficient representation. Okay. Don't do the transformation beforehand. Okay, okay, cool. All right. Yeah, perfect. Thanks. All right, thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye, everyone, and uh, see you all on, on, on Friday. I will just stop sharing, and I will end the meeting for all.